accepted him as your Lord and Savior in your heart. Okay. So, Mike, you're going to cover his nose and mouth. You're going to say these words. Say, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Tony. So we know Tony a little bit better than the other two. He's been with us for a, a while now, so I get to pick on him a little bit more. Um, <laughs> Tony is a young, healthy, strong young man, but in his heart, he's a mother. Nurturer. So, it's true. It's true. It's in there. It's in there. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, anytime the kids are here, Tony's always checking on them to make sure everybody's okay, make sure everything's going. And it's a beautiful trait. In fact, it's a godly trait to have. Not all of us have that, and I'm working on it, but someday. Um, but Tony just absolutely loves people. And he's a hard worker. You tell him a direction to go, and he goes that direction. We love him to death. Uh, spent some time in the woods with him where uh, Tom scared him about Bigfoot pretty bad. But anyway, Tony, do you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Yes. Did he die for your sins? Yes. Did he rise again three days later? Yes. Awesome. You ready to follow him in baptism? Yes. All right. So he said, I will, I will. Well, later that night he called me and he said, I went out in my shed. And he said, I said, God, I need to make things right. I made a promise to my friend and I need to make things right. So a little while after that, now Psycho, you got to understand, is a big, big man and, and got his nickname well. His real name is Scott. Uh, but me, and I weighed about 285 at the time, uh, and another pastor weighed about 280. We baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, he grabbed one of us with each arm, lifted us out of the water, shouting and screaming to God. It was a, one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen. There's shoes there. Uh, I'll leave those there. All right. But baptism is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you today for all you're doing in our lives. We thank you for this church, the beautiful, beautiful people that are here. Thank you for Miss Kristen Adams being back with us today. Yay, we are excited uh, that she is back with us. Others that are back today, Lord, God, we pray that you bless everything that we do here. Anoint my lips to speak life to your people in your precious and holy name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Uh, how many know baseball season's heating up, right? You going to come grab your shoes? Get the socks, too. They smell funny. Over 160 games of baseball season in a year. Baseball season's heating up, and if you know anything about me, I'm a Dodgers fan. Uh, Jimmy made me be a Dodgers fan. That's what he said I had to be when I came here. But um, 
The Dodgers are doing good this year. They're like, uh, well, let me look. I got it wrote down. Their, their record is 86 wins and 45 losses. It's the best record in baseball. That's pretty good, right? But let me ask you something. Have you ever looked at when a team is doing good, where they do good and where they don't? The Dodgers' home record is 52 wins and 17 losses. Phenomenal. Their away record is 34 wins and 28 losses. Home team advantage means something. Home team advantage means something, or home field advantage means something. They do much better when they're at home. And do you know, as born-again children of God, sometimes pastors and you alike, we feel like although we're part of this great big team and we're, we're part of this, this body of Christ together, but sometimes we almost feel like we're isolated. Would anybody admit that? Sometimes you feel like you're all alone out in the world, all by yourself. And no matter how hard you try, you still feel like you're out there and that you don't have any home field advantage, if you will. Today I want to talk to you about home field advantage. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, you know this is the faith chapter. And he talks about all those of great faith. And he talks about each and every one of those stand for the reading of God's word. And we get to the end of the chapter, and here's what the writer of the Hebrews says. And others had trial of cruel mockings, verse 36, and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Can I just stop right here and say this to you? If you ever get it in your mind that the world is not worthy of you, it'll change the way you see everything. If you ever get it in your mind that you are a child of God, a child of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and that the world is not even worthy of your presence in it, you'll begin to feel like, act like, the person that God created you to be. Moving on. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and all these have obtained a good report through faith received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Flip over to chapter 12. Wherefore seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endureth such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Miss Wendy, will you bless the reading of the word? Amen. You can be seated. The book of Hebrews was written to a church that had gone through a lot. They've been waiting on the promise. And while we talk about the, the, uh, the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and we talk about all those mighty men and women, do you ever stop and think about who this was written to and the time that it was being written? He was writing to a church that was struggling. 
He was writing to a church that was weary and tired. He was writing to a church that literally had felt like they had gone their last mile and that from there, for them, they were almost coasting till they got to heaven. They were at a place where they literally were tired. How many know that some of us today can get like that if we're not careful? We can literally get to a place where we're following God with all the motions, but we're not actually involved in what's going on. We've kind of lost that uh, along the way, maybe to complacency, maybe to sin, maybe to other things. But here's what he says in chapter 11, the end of it. He says to them, those continued to run the race. They continued considering all adversity was that was against them. They continued not even having received the promise yet, which we have the promise of Christ with us. But he literally said to them, they continued on. And then he says, therefore, the connector, therefore, having such a great cloud of witnesses around us, Now, Paul was a picture painter. If he was the one that wrote Hebrews, uh, you can say yay, you can say no. But he painted pictures. The author was painting a picture. So there's two ways that we can look at this. And I want to share them with you very quickly today. The first one is, picture this. How many is going through something right now? Be honest. I'm going through something right now (laughs) in my physical body. In Jesus' name, I am healed. He said that you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, one way to see this, metaphorically speaking, is to see that in heaven right now, every time you make a mistake, while the enemy's telling you you're no good, while the world is telling you you're no good, looking over the edge of heaven, metaphorically speaking, are the saints of old saying, you got this. Don't give up now. This is not time to quit. This is not time to back down. This is the time to set things aside. Take the weights off and let's run. We're almost to the finish line. I know you're tired. I know you're weak, but they literally are cheering for you. It's almost like a home field advantage. The enemy wants to block out the crowd. But if I can just stop and realize in my waiting, in my sickness, in my weakness, in my distress, in all those things that come against me, if I can just hear the crowd, they're saying, you got this. You've got this. Don't you dare give up now. Don't you let up now. How many born again men and women of God have given up at the doorstep right before they got to their victory? We see it every day in ministry. And I just wanted to come today to tell you that all of heaven is cheering for you. Now that's one way we can look at this. But let's look at this another way. The scripture says, therefore, being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And the word translates literally in the Greek to two different ways. It means that they are up there cheering, but it also means this, that they are saying, every one of us made it through. Every single one of us made it through, and every single one of us did not believe that we were going to make it to the next step. None of us thought we were going to make it to the next day. Every single one of us was tired and weary, but here we are today to tell you, you can do this. You can overcome. You've got this. All things are possible with God. And the enemy says, you sinned again. You messed up. And the Hebrews writes to us and says, keep going. Put it aside. Don't worry about the weight of the screw up. Don't worry about the mistake of yesterday. Ask for forgiveness and move on. It literally says, look to the crowd. Hear what they're saying to you. You can do this. But the enemy tells you you can't. Anybody been sick for a long, long time? I start going through these tests again this week. The nurse said, how long has it been since you've had this test? I said, well, I don't know. She said, well, you got to have this every year, but I don't see a record of one. I went, I don't know. know." She said, 
How long? I said, well, about eight years. Oh, eight years since I had the last. What? When I was 23, they told me I wouldn't survive, that I, I have a pheochromocytoma. I'm going to die before I'm 30. In about five days, I turned 53. They still say it's there from eight years ago, <laughs> the last time I had it checked. And they still say I'm going to die from it before I'm 30. <laughs> but here's what I know. God showed me a long time ago. You get up every day and you keep going. And we'll worry about what happens today, today. But we're not going to continue dragging the past with us. We're not going to continue. We're going to move forward. We're going to move forward. You have a crowd of witnesses. You literally have a home field advantage. Do you know what he said in the Old Testament? Father, open their eyes to see that the ones that are with us are far greater than those that are against us. There are people in this room who had tumors on their kidneys and they're still cancer free. Breast patients, cancer free. You say, well, we've lost some along the way. It's appointed unto man once to die. It's going to happen to everyone if Christ doesn't return first. But we cannot take what we know may happen and take it and apply it. trying to hurry but I probably shouldn't go here it's not in my notes I should probably shut up right now you know my mom has serious heart problems and and it's not good they're they're down to the point to where okay we've done about all we can do but two weeks ago I got a call said they found mesothelioma in her lung and that's what killed my dad he was an asbestos worker as you know and it's real hard to have faith for something you've watched others die with but we begin to pray and we begin to seek God and we begin to call on the church to pray without details and Thursday morning, I got the call that there is no mesothelioma in her lungs. Because we serve a miracle-working God. We serve a God that confounds and confuses the doctors. We serve a God that literally has a crowd of people cheering for you that have overcome. And they're saying to you right now, you can't back up. You can't back down. You can't let up. This is not the time for that. You have home field advantage. You have everyone out there yelling for you, shouting for you. Everyone on God's side is on your side. Look around the room. When you send out a prayer request, people begin to pray. People begin to move. I got to hurry. I got to go on. The whole book of Hebrews is basically written to a church that is in this place where they've been there so long ready for the next move of God, for the promise to be fulfilled, and yet it seems like it never comes. Hebrews chapter 2, he writes, pay close attention to what you have heard so you won't slip away. Hebrews 3 says, be careful not to fall away to temptation. Encourage one another to stay strong. Hebrews 5, he says, grow in grace and knowledge that you should literally be teaching by now. Hebrews 12, he says, strengthen those who are weak and the knees are feeble, strengthen them. With all the warnings, here's the nutshell of this thing. He says, Christ thinking of you thinking of you endured the cross and he finished the race that was set before him 
And if I could say anything to you, he finished the race for you. It's our time to finish the race for him. It's our time to stand up and keep moving. It's our time to put away the mistakes. It's our time to put away the sin. It's our way to time to put away everything that is holding us back and say, God, I continue to move forward for you. I'm going to finish strong. Not exactly the way I planned this morning. The good thing we go by his plans and not mine. The writer says that all of heaven is cheering for you to make it. All of heaven is cheering for you to win. All of heaven is cheering for you to win. And your brothers and sisters sitting in this room are cheering for you to win. And God said, I have already overcome the world. Don't give up now. Don't, I know it's tough, and I know it's hard, and I understand that, but this is not the time to give up. This is the time to press forward. And although I've got an enemy on the field against me, if I will just stop and realize that everyone in the stands is on my side, Everyone that's out there that made it said you can do this. You ever heard the eagle story? I'll give you the quick version. There were eagles in a valley. And this man, this man from the tribe came up and he was showing this pastor all the crosses of where eagles had died. And they get down in the valley. And when they get there, calcium begins to build up on their beaks. And they begin to, to get where they can't fly anymore. And calcium begins to build up. And they can't get up and go anymore. But at a certain time, other eagles begin to fly over, screaming and yelling and dropping meat to them and throwing meat down. And the eagles begin to climb. And they begin to get up on the rocks. Some of them don't. Some of them die in the valley. But the others begin to get up on the rocks. And they begin to beat their beaks on the rocks. And they begin to knock the calcium off. And they begin to be able to fly again. God did not design you to lose. He designed you to win. And the enemy is trying to destroy God's people. And it's time that we realize we're not alone in this. And we begin to fight like we've never fought before. We begin to push like we've never pushed before. I know we're waiting on the promise. I know, and I know if you look around in the world, things ain't right out there. But if you look back in history, things ain't never been right. But God's always been God. This morning, I come to tell you that you have home field advantage. Everyone around you is cheering for you to make it. Everyone around you, don't listen to what the enemy says. Don't listen to what the enemy says. Rise up. Begin to say, I'm going to fight. Hear the roar of the crowd. Every single one of them has overcome already. And they're shouting for you. Well, I'm never going to have the life I want. I'm never going to have. Stop. Trust God and begin to believe that, you know what? With God, all things are possible. I am who he said I am, not who the enemy says I am. I'm an overcomer through Christ Jesus. I'm victorious. I don't know what this afternoon holds. I don't know how I'm going to feel later, but all I know is I wasn't going to miss my opportunity to come here and share with you this morning that God is on your side. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Church, if you've been weary, tired, maybe you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I don't know what's going on in your life, but here's what I know. You serve a God that overcomes. 
And you've got a whole team cheering for you right now. And that shifts momentum. And it defeats the enemy before you ever start the battle. I don't know what you need prayer for. I don't know if that's a relationship you need prayer for. I don't know if that's finances you need prayer for. If that's physical healing. I don't know what your needs are. Maybe a family member. Maybe it's so you can let go of unforgiveness. But I know this, that God is on our side. And he's got a great cloud of witnesses that is cheering for you to overcome. And they're cheering for you this morning. Stand with me if you will. If I can get a couple or three of the elders to come up. They're going to lay hands on you and pray if you need prayer. You don't have to tell them what's going on. All you have to do is say this, say, I need prayer. I'm weary, I'm tired, I'm like the church that the writer of Hebrews wrote about. So long I've been waiting. I'm so tired. I need my miracle. And I want to press on. Father, I just want to honor you. Most days the enemy tells me I'm a failure. In many days, I believe what he says. God, I'm praying right now through the supernatural power of your son, Jesus, that we would rise up and be strengthened in knowing who you are to us. And that if they come, if anyone comes or if many come, that you will strengthen them today and let them know that we win. That the scoreboard is already done, we win. I pray that you heal bodies and minds and finances and families and that you bring promises to pass through the blood of your son, Jesus. Amen. You ladies, come on.